reading from the Gospel of John. There was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son because he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. The royal official says to him, Lord, come down before my child dies. Jesus says to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. They said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives, and he himself believed and his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he come out of Judea into Galilee. That was a reading from John. The author of John has one voice and many faces. He's been portrayed as a rustic fisherman, an educated Gnostic, an aged presbyter, a desert mystic, and I'd like to add another portrayal to that. I want us to picture the author of John as a Christian version of the robot Wally from the Disney film. But whereas Wally was digging through a mountain of rotting garbage, John is digging through, well, what John is digging through is a library of ancient Christian books. Like Wally, he's working by himself. He has no support from any scribes, any interns, and he's looking for any materials that can help him write his novel about Jesus. For the most part, he's repurposing what he finds in the books that are in this library. And occasionally, when he's examining one of the books, he finds an anomaly, something that makes his little robot alarm sensor go off. And in this case, his alarm goes off when he sees that he's found two different stories about Jesus in two different sources, and they're obviously related, but how they're related isn't clear to him. And the two stories are the healing of the Syrophoenician woman's daughter from the Gospel of Mark, which was our opening reading for episode 31, and the healing of the centurion servant from the common source behind Matthew and Luke, also known as the Q source. And John doesn't know what to make of this coincidence, so we're going to see some odd glitches that come in when he tries to adapt these tales. We're familiar with the story from Mark, but let's now go over the one from Matthew and Luke. Jesus enters Capernaum. He's asked to heal the centurion's servant. In Matthew, the centurion himself makes the request. In Luke, some elders of the Jews make the request on his behalf. Jesus agrees to go to the centurion's house and perform the healing, but the centurion suddenly pleads with him, saying that he's not worthy for Jesus to come to his house. He begs Jesus to perform the healing with only a word. Jesus says, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And he then dismisses him, telling him that the healing has been done. The Q author went to remarkable lengths to give the centurion an excuse for not wanting Jesus to come to his house. The real reason that Jesus couldn't come to his house was to protect the plot, because the centurion is a Gentile. And if a Gentile witnessed Jesus conducting a miracle firsthand, then the next logical step would be for them to believe in him, that is, become a Christian, basically. But according to the official early Christian backstory, the Gentiles only began to believe in Jesus after the apostolic mission had begun, and that was after Jesus had died and been resurrected. So for the Gentiles in the Gospels, Jesus can comment on their faith, he can heal them with a miracle, but there can't be an opportunity for them to convert on the spot. And so this is a problem, and the solution that's adopted by Mark, Matthew, and Luke is to only ever have Jesus heal Gentiles at long range. In this mini-series on the Gospel of John, we are demonstrating that John is a derivative text and that its author used the Synoptic Gospels, that is Mark, Matthew, and Luke, as his primary sources. And we're now going to examine the passage from our reading in that context. 
First of all, John's version of the story follows the Q version, the Matthew and Luke version, much more so than the Mark version. So he has chosen to adapt the healing of the centurion's servant. Only there's no centurion anymore. He's now a royal official. And the setting is Galilee during the Tetrarchy. And so this is supposed to be, uh, as Vince McMahon would say, some big muckety-muck in the court of Herod Antipas. And John made this change because depending on how you look at it, John is either A, much smarter, or B, much more honest than most of the Christian theologians who have ever analyzed the Gospels. When they look at the centurion story, they all try to come up with a BS reason as to why a centurion is depicted as living outside the boundaries of the empire. John looks at it and says, no, that's wrong. I'm changing it. He's smart enough to recognize that even if it is theoretically possible to come up with a reason to justify this, like say the the centurion is retired and he's now a mercenary who works for Herod Antipas, even still, John understands that there's no guarantee that that explanation is going to occur to the audience. And so he changes the story. And now the guy is still an influential figure, but now he actually matches the jurisdiction that he's found in. And I bet that John felt very smug about making this correction, very self-satisfied. They didn't even know that a centurion wouldn't be living in Galilee. But John is about to experience a reality check. He's created a much worse problem by making this change. And remember how I said before that we were going to find some glitches in his presentation here, and now a major one has manifested. Since this character is now Jewish, there's no longer any need for Jesus to perform the healing at long range. Because the long range healing was a literary device that the other gospels used out of necessity, but John maintains it here when there's no necessity anymore. And to make matters worse, he doesn't even bother to explain why Jesus is doing a long range healing still. For reasons that we'll get into, he couldn't use Matthew and Luke's rationale, and so the only other place he could turn to for help was Mark's version. And John borrowed two elements of Mark's tale of the Syrophoenician woman, and he used them as rationale for Jesus still having to do this miracle at a distance. First of all, in both John and Mark, the character knows that Jesus has entered the region before they've seen him. The Syrophoenician woman had heard that Jesus came to Tyre, just as the royal official heard that Jesus came to Galilee. By borrowing this element from Mark, John can have this scene take place sufficiently far away from the royal official's house so, like, it wouldn't be feasible for Jesus to walk there and heal his son. Because remember, Jesus is in Cana, and the royal official comes there from Capernaum. Like, he hears that Jesus is in the area, and he walks to Cana to see him. And so Jesus doing the healing from a distance is now fairly plausible, just on logistical grounds. He's like, I ain't schlepping all the way to Capernaum. I'll just do it from here. Now, the second thing that John borrowed from Mark to justify this distance healing was for Jesus to show frustration or even anger at the person who's asking for his help. In Mark, he told the woman that it isn't right to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. And in John, he unnecessarily tells the guy, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. But then the guy just repeats his request a second time, and Jesus immediately changes his mind. And not only that, but when the guy repeats the request, he specifically says that he wants Jesus to come and do the healing, like in person, but Jesus does it at long range anyway. This is what I mean by glitches. As for other parallels, there's the mention of the man's son being at the point of death, just as in Luke. There's Jesus dismissing him with the word go, as is common in the healing stories in the other Gospels. When the man is on his way home, his slaves meet him on the road and tell him that his son has been cured, and they tell him when it happened. And from that, he knows that it was at the hour that Jesus agreed to help. And that's very similar to the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus says the word, and we're told that the boy was healed that hour. And these slaves as well, they in themselves are a sign of John being derivative. They are legendary accretion. Their purpose is to be authenticating third parties that John felt were necessary because he noticed an exploitable loophole in the parallel miracle stories, which was that there was nothing that specifically confirmed that the man's son was healed because of Jesus. And having the man's slaves, who had had no prior involvement here, meet him on the road and tell him the time of day when it happened, really they're telling that to us so that we make the connection between Jesus saying the word and the boy getting better. And lastly, when the man learns what Jesus did for him, it says that he believed along with his whole household, which is a phrase that Acts of the Apostles uses on two separate occasions, both of which involve Gentiles converting to Christianity, and one of whom is a centurion. 
So these are some of the more obvious literary parallels, but the reason I wanted to cover this pericope in the opening segment is because today's episode, just by virtue of the part of John that we're examining, is going to involve a lot of miracles, or signs, as John sometimes calls them. And towards the end of the gospel, the narrator says, Jesus also performed many other signs in the disciples' presence that aren't written in this book. According to scholars like Hans Windisch and Paul N. Anderson, who believe, like me, that John was dependent on the other Gospels, the stress in that sentence should actually fall this way. Jesus performed many other signs that aren't written in this book. As in, he did a lot more signs in other books, like the Gospel of Mark, for example. But as John says, these ones have been written so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing, you can have life in his name. End quote. So John has acknowledged that he's only chosen specific signs to write about. And if we wanted to learn about any others, we could check those out in the other three Gospels. But when we do look at those Gospels, we find something rather curious, which is that signs is a term that the Jesus of those books specifically disavows. No sign will be given to this generation. It was the kingdom preaching movement, the sect that wrote the Q source. They were the ones who had a problem with the word sign. One of their sayings was, the only sign that this generation is going to get is the sign of Jonah. It's a saying that was later attributed to Jesus. And the conventional wisdom is that the sign of Jonah is supposed to be a reference to Jesus spending three days in the earth after he died and then being resurrected, just as Jonah spent three nights in the whale and was then spit out. But actually, that's only what the author of Matthew thinks the sign of Jonah refers to. In reality, the sign of Jonah simply means that in the same way that the prophet Jonah preached to the city of Nineveh and they repented and God didn't destroy them, so should this generation listen to the kingdom preaching movement, the contemporary Jonas, who are telling them to repent. It's more or less a sardonic statement. It's like saying that the preaching will continue until repentance improves. But by the time the author of John comes along, he is not at all interested in this kingdom preaching nonsense. For John, it is necessary that Jesus performed signs. John's understanding of normative Judaism is that the promised Messiah would reveal himself through signs. So he has to have Jesus doing the signs to be able to demonstrate that the Jews still rejected him, even though he did all the things that they expected the Messiah to do. And also, in John, Jesus is not only the promised Messiah, but he's also the pre-existent Logos and the Son of God who was present with God at the creation which means that the signs aren't only showing that he's the Messiah, they're also revealing his glory or his divinity. That's why John originally closed out the book with that two-part statement. I wrote down these signs so that you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah and God's son and so that you can believe and have life in his name. In other words, when you see them, you'll recognize that he comes from God. Now, preferably, you would have recognized that when he personally revealed it to you through his words, but if the words somehow didn't do it for you, the miracles will. As the scholar Randall Helm said, in the Synoptic Gospels, faith causes miracles, but in the Gospel of John, miracles cause faith. And that's why, in the story from our reading, John couldn't follow Matthew and Luke's rationale for Jesus not physically going to the man's house. Their rationale was that the man already believed that Jesus could do the miracle from where he was standing. John cannot afford to say that. He's very careful, almost lawyerly, in making sure that the man did not say that he believed in Jesus until the miracle had already been done. The Synoptic Gospels are evolutions of the very first efforts to create the Jesus of Nazareth character, the very first efforts to adapt the historical books of the Old Testament and the prophecies of the second and third Isaiah into a narrative about Jesus' ministry. Most of the confusing tropes and literary devices that we find in the Synoptic Gospels are simply the author's attempted solutions to the fundamental flaws of that adaptation process. For example, it is confusing and counterintuitive that the Jesus of Mark, Matthew, and Luke will only ever heal someone after they acknowledge that they believe in him. In fact, that's something that might even make modern Christian converts uneasy. You know, say, if they're being introduced to the Gospels for the first time, and they might be thinking, like, how did that woman know to touch the hem of his garment? Would I have known to do that? I don't think I would. I probably would have just seen Jesus as another random faith healer. But actually, that feeling of doubt and that self-questioning is a hint as to why the authors used that literary device in the first place. 
because there was no historical ministry of Jesus in anything resembling the form that's being depicted. And the way the authors covered for that, the way they covered for the lack of any external record, the lack of any organic tradition, was with literary tricks like the messianic secret and this idea that faith leads to miracles. Jesus performed many miracles, you know, but you had to have faith in order to see them, just like you have to have faith now in the midst of all your doubt. The Gospel of John clashes so violently with this, partly because of how late it was written, but mainly because John was deliberately correcting the other Gospels on this point. And that's why the author of John is off by himself in that library, sorting through a mountain of garbage. His goal is to establish a counter-narrative. He doesn't understand how anyone could portray Jesus as a prophet, a miracle worker, as doing signs, although for some reason we're not allowed to call them signs, and yet no one can recognize any of this unless they already have faith. I mean, where are they getting that faith from? Just because John the Baptist came by and, and vouched for this man? Who cares about that loser? And so to establish this counter-narrative, the author of John uses material from the synoptic miracle stories, and he corrects and critiques their viewpoint as often as he can. And finally, in the farewell discourse, he uses the Jesus character to deliver his closing statement that sums up his whole position on signs and wonders. Quote, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Last time, we introduced the general framework theory, which says that the very structure of the Gospel of John presupposes the other three Gospels. And we're now finding even more evidence to support that since we're finding that the miracle stories in John are in dialogue with the miracle stories in the other books. Because these tales, these miracles in John, are not, like, unprecedented. They aren't groundbreaking. In fact, in some ways, John is actually more conservative than the other three Gospels on this topic. Mark, Matthew, and Luke, all three of them walk the line of implying that everyday Christians can perform the same miracles that Jesus did. The only reason they don't explicitly say that is because they recognized how anachronistic it would be to do so. But John only pays lip service to that whole concept, and other than that, he breaks no new ground in these sign stories. The only really novel thing about them is that the author has simply taken the synoptic view of miracles and turned it on its head. And so for all the stylistic differences in the Gospel of John, all the mysticism, all that testimony about how it speaks to the believer's heart, all the praise that's lavished on this author by scholars who are so impressed at this brilliant religious genius who created a river where a child can wade and an elephant can swim, all this book ultimately is, is a pedantic correction a crabby critique of other novels about Jesus that its lonely author in his post-apocalyptic library didn't like. You're listening to Born in the Second Century, and it's now 5 p.m. on November 19th, 2023. This is episode 34 of the Podcast of Record of the United States of America, hosted by Chris Palmero. The music for today's broadcast was provided by the recording group Pompey Gray. For our inspirational quote to begin the show, I've selected a passage from the Gospel of Thomas. Quote, Jesus said, The Father's kingdom is like a person who wanted to kill someone powerful. While still at home, he drew his sword and thrust it into the wall to find out whether his hand would go in. Then he killed the powerful one. And it stops right there, and it continues right here, because I think what my friend Jesus is trying to say is that we always have to be humble. Especially me. And I know I just made that joke about being the podcast of record, but it's important to remind ourselves that no matter how successful we are, there's always someone waiting to take our place. They're off somewhere right now repeatedly thrusting their sword into a wall, practicing and preparing. That's why we should always remember that to conduct oneself with pride or arrogance or pomposity is totally unacceptable. That's why I opened with that Jesus saying, A blue wolf took as its spouse a fallow doe, and they settled at the head of the Onan River to raise their offspring, the great radical criticism podcast called Born in the Second Century, to which I urge you to like, subscribe, and follow. Please also join the community of readers by supporting the Patreon and unlocking the monthly bonus shows, patreon.com slash born in the second century. As for today's episode, we continue our mini-series on the Gospel of John as being a derivative work that draws primarily on the synoptic Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke. 
We're looking for any evidence, any signs that John is a secondary text. And the John miniseries is a subset of our larger Justin Martyr series, as we'll circle back to Justin for the conclusion. And John being a secondary text and being derivative of the Synoptic Gospels does not also mean that John is exclusively based on the Synoptic Gospels. In my view, John also had access to some of the sources of the Gospels, which would not have been out of the ordinary. In episode 29, I quoted Pliny the Elder, who commented on all the authors he had consulted in writing his natural history, and he found that some of them had copied earlier authors, whose books he also had. But today, we'll continue our progress through the Gospel, and as I said before, there are quite a few miracle stories in the section of John that we're covering. As for our sources, in the last show, I went over most of them, but there are a few that I have to add. Uh, Well, first off, as a general reminder, the entire John miniseries is basically a response to the theologian Percival Gardner-Smith. He was one of the first to make the case that John was totally independent of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and he laid out his case in his famous book, A Load of Absolute Tat, from 1938. I don't know. That doesn't sound like the title that I said last time. I thought the word John was in the title. Maybe it was the subtitle. Uh, I'm adding a few sources onto our list, as I said. First of all, I cited the theologian R. Allen Culpepper last time, but I never mentioned his book. It's called Anatomy of the Fourth Gospel, and it's from 1983. Paul N. Anderson, The Riddles of the Fourth Gospel, from 2011, and Randall Helms, Gospel Fictions, from 1988. At this point, Gospel Fictions should just be an assumed source for every episode. I also wanted to clarify here that the interview clip with St. Candida from last time was from the 7 a.m. show on BBC Radio 4 Sunday from August 27, 2023. But the question we should be asking ourselves throughout today's episode is the central question of this miniseries. If the theologians didn't need the Gospel of John as a witness for the historical Jesus, would they have ever bothered to insist on its independence, especially given all the parallels that we continue to find between John and the other canonical Gospels? Back after this. We'll continue from where we left off last time. Jesus is still in Jerusalem after beating everyone up in the temple. There's one other thing I have to mention about that temple incident. I recognize that I'm by no means the first one to observe this, but it is not normal that Jesus suffers no immediate consequences for driving out the money changers. Especially when you consider that one of the pillars of the minimum historical Jesus narrative is that Pontius Pilate and the Romans were on a hair trigger to stamp out any potential source of civil unrest. And that's how the theologians explain the paths of glory-esque nature of Jesus' trial. They set aside the reason for Jesus' condemnation that the Gospels actually present, which was that the Jewish leaders instigated Pilate to condemn Jesus. And because they set that explanation aside, the only other option in reading that trial scene is that in history, the trial of Jesus was a summary affair like a drumhead or whatever, where Pilate was just not messing around. But if that's the case, then why didn't the Romans act when Jesus stormed the temple, including the Romans who were stationed at the fort in the temple, for example? It could be argued that maybe in real life, the historical Jesus stormed the temple and was indeed immediately arrested and tried and executed. Some have argued that. 
The problem with that is that it's yet another instance in which we're being asked to trust what the gospel authors say over here, but don't trust what they say over here. Because all four gospels portray Jesus as doing the temple storming and then not only teaching in the temple, but teaching in the temple over a period of days. Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, is what he says in some versions of the arrest scene. So for John to then come along and consider it to be totally normal that Jesus can storm the temple and then just go back to it again over a period of days like nothing happened, to me, the only explanation for that is that John is based on the other Gospels, since it's historically unfeasible. And in fact, it's something that only makes sense in the logic of those books. Mark had sources that placed certain controversy stories in the temple, and he also had a source that said that Jesus stormed the temple. After Mark had decided to turn his gospel into a kind of a progress from Galilee to Jerusalem, he had no choice other than to have the temple storming precede the controversy stories, and Matthew and Luke followed him. And hopefully you can now see that John followed him too, regardless of how John messed with the overall itinerary. But let's leave the temple behind. Let's check in with Nicodemus, whom the author calls a ruler of the Jews. This man went to visit Jesus, and it was raining and it was night, and they had a theological discussion. We did a reading from this passage last time, and we talked about how it's one of the most influential passages in the New Testament. It not only inspired the Austin 316 promo, but it also inspired a Roots Reggae song by the Congos. In that song, we are informed by the Congos that Nicodemus went to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and right. And I'm sorry, Congos, that is not strictly correct that Nicodemus asked him about the way of salvation. I can see why you made that mistake, though, because Jesus responds to Nicodemus as if that's what he'd asked him about. In reality, he had only made an irrelevant comment about how Jesus had to have come from God because of all the signs he's doing. But none of that really even matters because Nicodemus here is only really a stand-in. Jesus is actually in front of a giant green screen, and he's really talking to the audience. Nicodemus wasn't even on set with him that day. John just stuck some googly eyes on a pole and he said, that's Nicodemus for today. Imagine you're talking to a real guy when you look at that. Because Jesus mostly talks past Nicodemus here. And the first thing he says is, unless someone is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. And it's well known that born again could technically also be read as born from above. I say that that's well known because the moderate Christians never stop reminding everyone about it. The only reason they do that is because there's a huge and influential demographic called born-again Christians whom the moderates hate. If there was no such thing as born-again Christians, then the double meaning here would just be a footnote in the study Bible. But as it turns out, it may end up having some relevance for our purpose, which is to find out whether John is derivative. And to do that, let's first call up an image in our minds the image of Jesus surrounded by children. It's a popular subject in contemporary Christian art, and for whatever reason, they usually paint it in the style of socialist realism. And sometimes there's a caption or a quote that's associated with it, let the children come to me. It's something Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, after which he continues, don't hinder them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, Whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child won't enter it. And there's a parallel between that and what Jesus has said to Gamaliel here about having to be born again. The idea that the only way to know the kingdom of God is to revert to the earliest stage of life by being born again or born from above or receiving the kingdom like a child. When Matthew takes over this theme from Mark, we get an even closer parallel to the Nicodemus dialogue. Matthew has Jesus say, unless you're turned or changed or converted and become like children, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. So the parallel is clear, added to which John does not like this phrase, the kingdom of God. In fact, here in this dialogue is the only place he ever says it. And even that appears to be something that he's doing only grudgingly, since in the first kingdom of God quote, the one about being born again, we find that the kingdom of God is not something you enter, as it was in the other gospels, but it's now something that you see or experience. At this early stage in the dialogue, he wants to equate Jesus himself with the kingdom of God. But after that, Jesus goes on to say, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. And this is notable, primarily because the scenes in the other gospels that I just mentioned of Jesus interacting with the children, the children very clearly symbolize initiates to the Christian faith. Now, Mark never says that outright. 
But Matthew and Luke both instinctively recognize it because in their parallel sections, they bring in other quotes that apply to the treatment of initiates. And John, having access to Mark, he also recognizes that the story is about initiates. And that's why I first had us call up this uh, social realism scene from Mark and to keep it in mind. Because it's not only that John adapted Mark's quote about receiving the kingdom like a child, he's also aware of the entire immediate context in Mark. And that's why, in this same section, he has Jesus deliver a saying about baptism. And in fact, he even lapses into Mark's own language when he makes Jesus now say that unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. The author of John is an early Catholic Christian, but a heterodox one. And he often feels pressure to promote the official Catholic line. And he does that here with these two side-by-side quotes about the kingdom of God. He promotes his own ideology with the one where Jesus says that you can't see the kingdom unless you're born again. And he promotes the official doctrine with the next line, in which he recognizes that in the precise year of 27 AD, in which he has set this gospel, the earthly Jesus could never have said, unless you're born of water, you can't see the kingdom of God. That would imply that Peter and the rest of the Twelve and the other followers of Jesus are illegitimate, since none of them were depicted as being baptized at any time. And so that's why John has to lapse back into the language of the synoptics in this line where he has Jesus now referring to the official initiatory rite. And he says that you need to do that right in order to enter the kingdom of God. There's even another indication here that John is following the other Gospels. I said that John was aware not only of the saying about receiving the kingdom like a child, but of the whole surrounding context in that section of Mark. What happens in Mark after the scene with the children is that a man runs up to Jesus and asks him what he should do to inherit eternal life. In other words, the man asks Jesus the very question that Jesus seems to have thought Nicodemus asked him in the Gospel of John. In Luke's version of the dialogue where the the man asks Jesus about eternal life, the man is called a ruler, just as Nicodemus is called a ruler of the Jews here in the Gospel of John. And because John chose to accept and to develop this concept of Nicodemus as a ruler, as a person of importance, because he wanted Nicodemus to function as, well, the Nicodemus character in John outside of this scene is an example of legendary accretion in and of himself, because his function is to reveal to the audience how it was that the later Christians knew all what the Pharisees had been saying behind closed doors. And so once John decided to go in that direction and develop Nicodemus as a man of authority in the religious sphere, he then couldn't very well have had him go into this meeting with Jesus and say like, yo, Rabbi, what do I, uh, what do I got to do to be saved? John realizes that it would be ridiculous to have a ruler of the Jews asking some upstart about the way of salvation. And that's why there's such a disconnect between what Nicodemus says and how Jesus responds. Nicodemus basically says that he suspects that Jesus might be the Messiah. I mean, that's clearly where he was going with that comment about God being with him because of all the signs he was doing. So here, in general, the case could be made that John was also drawing on the Gospel of Luke and beginning with the concept of a ruler asking how to be saved, but then spinning that out in his own peculiar fashion. And just by way of foreshadowing, at the end of this miniseries, when we check in with Justin Martyr, We're going to find that Justin does not know the born-again saying in the same form that John does. And the fact that Justin's version of the saying is actually more primitive than John's version is only going to end up being half the story. But we'll now move on to the next section in the gospel. Last time we covered John the Baptist monologue number one. And so now we have John the Baptist monologue number two to contend with. The only reason for there being two John the Baptist monologues is general framework theory. The structure of John's gospel presupposes the other three gospels. The previous scene that featured John the Baptist was just an analog of a scene from Mark, Matthew, and Luke, where John the Baptist preaches in the wilderness and Jesus gets baptized. There was way too much going on in that scene for the author of John to sufficiently squash the John the Baptist character, and that's why he has to bring him back. Like last time, he puts John the Baptist in an appropriately fake location, Ainon near Salim. And like last time, he suggests that Jesus and John the Baptist are in close physical proximity, but they never interact. In Mark and Matthew, Jesus and John the Baptist are in the same physical location only in the wilderness scene at the beginning. In Luke, Jesus and John the Baptist don't interact in that scene. Now, the mainstream scholars, they they always say that that's because Luke doesn't like the idea of Jesus being baptized. You know, like Mark was slightly okay with it, 
Matthew was slightly less okay with it. Luke was not very okay. And John was not at all okay. That's the scholarly explanation that we're given for the differences in these wilderness scenes. But if you actually look closely at the Gospel of Luke, it seems that the reason for Luke being so cagey about the baptism, where he just says, you know, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. He seems less concerned about the idea of Jesus being baptized than he is about Jesus coming face to face with John the Baptist. Now, later on in Luke, in a scene that also occurs in Matthew, John the Baptist will be put into prison, and from there he'll send emissaries to Jesus, but the two don't actually come into physical contact. And as I discussed in episode 9, the source of most of this awkwardness is that when the very earliest Christian sources were written, John the Baptist was understood to have been a figure from the distant past. He indeed heralded the coming of the Messiah, but he did that decades before anything resembling the Christian faith ever got started. But eventually, after the early Christians had decided to bring Jesus down to earth and give him a full backstory, someone had the genius idea to make John the Baptist literally herald Jesus and literally anoint him as the returning Elijah. Since that was the character's only purpose for being added to the story, and there was no real, authentic tradition about him and Jesus being contemporaries or Jesus being one of his students or one of his followers, the gospel authors had nothing else for this character to do after that. So they threw his ass in jail based on that Josephus passage, which I go back and forth on whether that thing is legitimate or not, but if it is, then we could easily explain why the gospel authors conflict with it by changing the reason for the imprisonment, because what they depict is that John the Baptist was jailed because of court intrigue, and they choose to convey that by plagiarizing the book of Esther and not even trying to hide that fact. But in the Josephus passage that talks about John the Baptist, it says that Herod put him in jail for the express purpose of not agitating other Jews. And that makes it difficult to believe the Q story where John the Baptist can send messengers to Jesus from his prison cell. So rather than change the Q source, the gospel authors instead changed history by coming up with a fake story about John the Baptist's imprisonment that made it look like Herod didn't want to imprison him in the first place. And that therefore explains why his security was so lax. And so that's why his followers could go back and forth and they could communicate messages to Jesus. But all this is academic. The point is, the Synoptic Gospels had a compelling reason for Jesus and John the Baptist to never be seen in the same location at the same time after the anointing scene. The author of John, however, need not be beholden to the same constraint, especially if he's truly independent, and especially because he's in the process of totally reimagining the John the Baptist character and its relationship to the Jesus character. So the author can literally do anything he wants, and yet, just like the other three Gospels, John just somehow knows that these two aren't supposed to have a face-to-face interaction at this point. Now, he does walk right up to that line by having them in the same place, but he doesn't dare cross it. Now, why? unless he knew that he was bound by the same constraints that his predecessors were, because he was aware of and used their books. But let's continue with this scene. John the Baptist is baptizing in this fake place, and people were coming to him, quote, because John hadn't yet been thrown into prison. Nowhere else in this book is it ever said that John the Baptist went to prison. The author's assuming that you've read the other Gospels and learned that detail from them. And in fact, he's correcting the other Gospels here because he needs to have John the Baptist officially pass the torch in a way that's completely of his own volition. But I actually want to look at this line a bit more closely here, where the narrator says that John hadn't yet been thrown into prison. Many theologians have identified this line as being written by the ecclesiastical redactor, or as Raymond Brown called it, somewhat sarcastically, the church censor. And this, according to them, was a theorized editor, or a censor, basically, who was a member of the mainstream church and was responsible for cleaning up the Gospel of John prior to its being incorporated into the Orthodox faith. Now, in the last episode, I did compare the Gospel of John to Helen, the follower of Simon Magus, who'd been rescued from a brothel. I didn't mean by that that John was a product from outside the mainstream church. I think the Gospel of John was written by a heterodox member of the mainstream church. To the extent that the mainstream church cleaned it up, they didn't necessarily do so through editing, but more so through harmonization. And guys like Clement and Irenaeus were very well versed in that. But there are many theologians, like I said, who believe that John underwent a final edit. They've struggled to account for John's overall strangeness and its differences with the other Gospels. And so they therefore, they've sometimes portrayed it as having originally been a Gnostic or a heretical book that was co-opted by the early Catholics. 
And a key element of that theory is that this ecclesiastical redactor person then went over this thing with a hammer and a blowtorch, and they both cut out offensive material, and they added orthodox material to counteract the Gnostic overtones of the book. In fact, David Trobish, who has the theory about the first edition of the New Testament, he just came out with a new book, and in it, he indeed says that this specific line about John the Baptist not being sent to prison yet was one of the lines written by the redactor which he calls the publisher. It's effectively the same thing. I don't believe in this ecclesiastical redactor, I have to say. The redactor theory is like bumper bowling. It's a safeguard that theologians have installed in the Gospel of John to allow them to still claim that John is independent. Because it just so happens that all the lines that they end up attributing to this ecclesiastical redactor are the exact same lines that clearly show the unquestionable dependence of John on the synoptic Gospels. You know, like here, where he says that this all happened before John the Baptist went to jail, but he never references that again or explains what he's even talking about. So, like I said, it's bumper bowling. They get to win no matter what, and they get to have the best birthday ever. But here's something to think about with this ecclesiastical redactor. If the redactor was an orthodox, mainstream, early Catholic Christian and was tasked with bringing the Gospel of John in line with mainstream doctrine— Why would this redactor introduce even more difficulties into this book than there were to begin with? Like, why would he say John hadn't been thrown into prison yet? Why wouldn't he just delete the whole scene, since the comment actually still clashes with the synoptic gospels? Why later on would he have Jesus give a psychotic speech about how you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Why couldn't he have just copied and pasted the actual words of institution from the other gospels? And why bother to explain, as he does later on, that Jesus himself wasn't baptizing, his disciples were the ones who were baptizing? Again, just delete the whole sentence. So that was the redactor, but going back to the subject of Jesus and John the Baptist not being active at the same time, I want to bring in something from the theologian Percival Gardner Smith on that topic. It's from his famous book about John's gospel being independent. And he thought that it was very significant that John's gospel differs from the other gospels on whether Jesus and John the Baptist had contemporaneous ministries or whether they didn't. Quote, At a time when Mark was known in the churches, an evangelist could hardly have represented Jesus and John as exercising their ministries simultaneously. Such a departure from the synoptic scheme would have at once been recognized and an explanation demanded. End quote. First of all, how do you know that an explanation would be demanded? I mean, that assumes that these books are being freely shared and discussed with the congregation, like in modern churches or modern Bible study sessions. But these books, as I've said before, were by clerics for clerics. Everyone else got to hear hand-picked selections by designated readers. The second problem with what he said, and inarguably the bigger one, is that the scenario that he's saying is impossible is what actually happened. The Gospel of John does clash with the Synoptic Gospels in a lot of ways, yet all four books made it into the New Testament. So clearly, the early Christians didn't require any explanation for all the differences, or maybe they did get an explanation, and it was super convincing. And it was in person, though, so we just don't know about it anymore. But more to the point, Jesus and John the Baptist aren't actually conducting simultaneous ministries here, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But first, I want to cover something that I alluded to a few seconds ago. We're told here that Jesus was baptizing and gaining more disciples than John the Baptist was. But then, later on, the author qualifies that by using his his DVD director's commentary technique. And he says, actually, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus wasn't baptizing, but his disciples were. And this would appear to be a conflict with the other Gospels, and quite an intriguing one, actually. Maybe John has inadvertently revealed a suppressed alternate backstory for Jesus here. But in reality, this thing about Jesus or the disciples performing baptisms isn't really mysterious at all. It's just something the author was forced to say solely because of his decision to artificially inject John the Baptist into this scene. First of all, because John the Baptist is now in the scene, he must therefore be baptizing. I mean, what else would he be doing? But we shouldn't depict him as being too successful at baptizing because now Jesus has entered the mix. Why would anyone want to be baptized by John at this point? But we can't depict him as baptizing zero people because we still need the audience to take him seriously for this monologue that he's about to do. After that, he can go pound sand, as the saying goes. So this is the conundrum that the author is facing. And what he comes up with, I think it's fairly stupid, but I can still somewhat discern his logic. And that is to tell us that Jesus and John were both baptizing, but Jesus was baptizing more people than John was. 
And then before we actually get a chance to really internalize that statement, once the author has gotten that all important monologue out of the way, he can then walk back what he said earlier. And that's when he says that actually it was the disciples who were baptizing, not Jesus himself. And so the author of John is like a fraudulent company that's doing a walk back of something that on his previous financial statements, like actually that $30 million revenue from last quarter that was a $30 million loss, actually. The thing about Jesus performing baptisms was simply a temporary expedient to make John the Baptist's inclusion in this scene more realistic. Notice how Jesus and the disciples are never depicted as baptizing ever again. And that, by the way, is why some scholars really want the secret gospel of Mark to be authentic, because if it were authentic, then we would have multiple attestation for Jesus doing baptisms. In fact, this entire section of John's gospel is a goldmine of material that supports the minimum historical Jesus, if someone deliberately chooses to read it that way. Because the comment about Jesus baptizing at the same time that John is baptizing, it kind of does give support to the theory that Jesus may have begun his career as John's student or his follower, kind of like how Shredder was the student of fucking Splinter or Hamato Yoshi. But then Jesus went off on his own after an acrimonious split from John the Baptist, and then the later church suppressed all this. But what I would say to that is, if Jesus really did start out as a disciple of John the Baptist, there would be much more in these books to support that. And certainly Jesus wouldn't be made to deliver quotes like, from the days of John the Baptist until now, and that. But at this point in the scene, the actual monologue happens, and this is the only reason that John the Baptist is even here. After this, he disappears. The author sets him up for the speech by telling us that there was an argument about purification going on, and it does sound like a non sequitur, but as we'll see, it does end up being significant. And this whole monologue is very much staircase wit. The author's using it to have John the Baptist deliver all the lines he wished he could have put up in chapter one, and even still, there are very frequent parallels to lines from the other Gospels. For example, John the Baptist says, A man can take nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven which is an allusion to the trick question that Jesus asked the Pharisees. Was John's baptism from heaven or from men? Then we get a very clear indication that the author knew Mark and at least one other gospel, possibly even the Q source, because he has John the Baptist say, quote, You yourselves testify for me that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent ahead of him, end quote. Now, if we go back up to chapter one and look for that statement that he's referring to, we won't find it. What he actually seems to be referring to is the opening lines of Mark, the quotation of Malachi chapter 3. And yet a few lines later, John the Baptist says about Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. And that's reminiscent of the line from the Q source. Among those born of women, there's no one greater than John the Baptist, but even the one who's the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. Now here's the thing. In the Q source, that line was preceded by the Malachi quote. So the author of John's gospel clearly knows that those two lines are to be associated. But he seems to recognize as well that the Malachi verse also applies to the scene towards the beginning, where John the Baptist is in the wilderness. And that's why he has John the Baptist imply that he had quoted that verse earlier when he actually didn't. And so basically what the author is doing is pulling whatever content he can from the synoptic gospels and using that as a frame from which he can hang his new updated presentation of this character. And that's especially clear from something else he has John the Baptist say, quote, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So, this joy of mine has been made full, end quote. And that mention of the bridegroom reminds us of the controversy story from Mark. They asked Jesus why the Pharisees fast and the disciples of John the Baptist fast, but his disciples don't fast. And he says the friends of the groom don't fast when the groom is still with them. And that happened right after an argument that Jesus had been in over the fact that he was eating with tax collectors and sinners, which we could almost say was an argument about purity, just as the comment about the bridegroom here in the Gospel of John followed an argument about purification. And so this section of the Gospel of John is a midrash on the Gospel of Mark. But now that we've extensively covered two appearances of John the Baptist, I hope it's now clear that this author is utterly dependent on the Synoptic Gospels for the portrayal of this character. The Synoptics are his starting point. They provide him with his framework, and he only deviates from them to correct them in certain matters of theology and doctrine. 
He has his own opinions about John the Baptist that are at odds with, say, Mark's opinions, but he doesn't have any independent information or any independent tradition that can help him build a coherent counter-narrative. And so he has to try to build that counter-narrative within the synoptic framework, and the results are sad and also kind of lame at the same time. Moving to the next sequence, we accompany Jesus on his return to Galilee. So far, we followed him from Bethany beyond the Jordan to Cana, which is in Galilee, and that's where the wedding took place. Then he went to Capernaum, which is also in Galilee, where he literally did nothing. Then he went to Jerusalem and stormed the temple, and now he's heading back to Galilee. And I bring this up because it's an itinerary that doesn't make sense. Okay, The author of John either changed something, edited something the wrong way, or screwed something up. That's another reason why I don't believe in the ecclesiastical redactor, by the way. How did the redactor manage to make all these changes and additions and somehow miss every single one of the two million continuity errors in this book? But before Jesus can reach Galilee here, John does a bait and switch when he says that first Jesus had to pass through Samaria. That statement in itself shows that John is derivative because the author feels the need to explain and apologize for Jesus going to Samaria. It was the Q community, the kingdom preaching movement, that introduced an anti-Samaritan bias into the record. Matthew was operating in their tradition when he famously has Jesus tell the disciples not to evangelize any city of the Samaritans. But this exclusivism made less and less sense over time. Even Matthew himself has Jesus negate that order at the end of his book. But by the time we get to Luke and John, they're almost trying to rewrite history and give Jesus as much interaction with Samaritans as they can plausibly get away with. First, Luke has the disciples go to Samaria to prepare a house for Jesus, but then he goes on to say that the Samaritans didn't receive him. But later on, Jesus is going to Jerusalem, and it said that he had to pass between Samaria and Galilee, which makes no sense. Now, in episode 22, uh, I equated that passage in Luke to someone who says, I went to Georgia by passing between North and South Carolina. I don't know why no one corrected me, especially since Georgia and North Carolina in particular are two of my biggest states for listenership. But sometime after that episode, I was traveling in the region, and I learned that it actually is possible to go to Georgia by passing between North and South Carolina. So I strike my analogy from the record, but the point remains. Galilee was on top of Samaria, so you couldn't pass between them to get to Jerusalem. But Luke didn't care about that. He was just creating any pretext that he could to get a Samaritan in front of Jesus without Jesus having to actually enter Samaria. And what happens is that he heals a Samaritan leper who then believes in him. Just as an aside, Jesus never heals any lepers in the Gospel of John, whereas he healed several trillion in the synoptics. So it's similar to the lack of exorcism stories. But back to the Samaritans. John, just like Luke, also wants Jesus to have a Samaritan ministry. But he, just like Luke, also understands that he can't put too much of an emphasis on it. He has to treat it as a side quest in Jesus' overall mission. And luckily for John, because he always tries to be so scrupulous about historical and geographical details, by making Jesus walk from Judea in the south to Galilee in the far north, he has thereby given Jesus an excuse to complete his little Samaritan side quest. And that's why I said that John apologizes for Jesus showing up there. He's like, what? He was going to Galilee and he had to pass through. I mean, what do you want? And he then brings Jesus to Jacob's well, where he encounters the official mascot of Born in the Second Century, the Samaritan woman who has had five husbands. We've talked about her so many times that she's practically an employee at this point. I should actually commission a new logo based on this scene and these characters. Now, the famous New Testament scholar B.H. Streeter said that this Samaritan woman is based on the Syrophoenician woman from the Gospel of Mark, and that like the Syrophoenician woman, she symbolizes the extension of Christianity beyond the confines of Judaism. I think there's nothing that strictly prevents that reading, but I think that John is using symbolism to telegraph that this is indeed Jesus' mission to the Samaritans, in that he's meeting a Samaritan woman at a well, and that's a reference to a trope that's used about 18 times in the Old Testament, where a foreign woman is betrothed to a man after a chance meeting at a well. So Samaria is being symbolically betrothed to Jesus. And we mentioned in episode 3 that it could also draw from a similar story from the Buddhist religion and it functions on even another level as a comment on the Simonian sect. And if the Samaritan woman does also symbolize Helen, the companion of Simon, then the betrothal concept could tie in with that, 
Jesus is now going to be Samaria's faithful husband, not like the ones they had before, like the Simonians who only ever let them down. But these two characters, they have their encounter at the well. And this is the point where John decides to chime in with his DVD commentary narration technique in like every other sentence. First of all, the woman is surprised that Jesus is even talking to her. So we get the author cutting in on the commentary track because of that. Like, the reason she was so surprised, folks, is because Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus says that he wants her to give him a drink. And so that's another excuse for John to pause the video. And he's going to explain that as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why Jesus said that is because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. Jesus didn't need any food because the first thing he did that day was to take one capsule of ultimate Hellenistic fish oil. It's a powerful formula blend that contains ultra-pure acai and krill oil, high-quality wild-caught unmodified salmon oil from Bethany Beyond the Jordan, and more incredible natural ingredients to help support his mind and body. With Ultimate Hellenistic Fish Oil, Jesus experienced the benefits of super-concentrated EPA and DHA in a single capsule, and so can you. So the narrator is especially keyed into this scene, and that leads me to a point that I wanted to make about these commentary sections. Now, last time, I said that it's often an indication that John is trying to explain or correct something that came from the other Gospels. And we've seen many examples of him using the technique that way, and we're going to continue to see more of them. But sometimes, like here, where he explains why the disciples weren't present and stuff, it's really just basic narration. But the thing is, we're so unaccustomed to seeing that in the Gospels that when John does it, we instantly start looking for like a source-critical explanation. But in these instances, John is only doing what an author normally does. It's just that the Gospels are so strange that when they actually do present something in a conventional way, it doesn't even register. And that goes back to general framework theory, because with these clarifying comments, these bits of narration, John is inadvertently conveying something to us about his understanding of what a Gospel is. As an author, John recognizes that in this genre in which he's writing, whatever he would have actually called it, the tone should always be very detached and almost rhythmic or monotonous. Like, then he went to the well, then he said this. And John knows that it isn't supposed to be very lively or confessional or anything. Like, there were Greco-Roman historians and biographers at this time whose tone was like this. Let's talk about the Spartans. A lot of people think they know all about the Spartans, but I recently traveled to Sparta and saw it for myself. And John knows that that is not appropriate for the kind of book that he's writing because he's working off previous examples. But we can also see that occasionally he finds that required format to be too limiting. And that's why he sometimes pauses the video and talks to us directly. And it sounds like a third party writing a later comment in the margin. But continuing with this scene... Jesus and the Samaritan woman have their talk, and then Jesus performs a miracle of sorts. Luke had had Jesus perform a healing miracle during his Samaritan side quest, but John's alleged miracle is that Jesus tells the woman that he knows about her five previous husbands, which she is far too quick to credit him with prophetic knowledge for saying that. I mean, he could have just looked it up in the courthouse right before this. But she is just blown away, and she runs off to the nearby city to tell everyone— and that action on her part is how John officially lets us know that this was indeed a miracle, because from that point on, his story begins following the pattern of the Gerasene demoniac tale, which is an exorcism story that's found in the other three Gospels. And from last time, we know that even though John doesn't record any exorcisms being done by Jesus, he nonetheless takes elements of the exorcism stories from the synoptics and repurposes them. When the woman runs off to tell her fellow Samaritans about Jesus, it's a parallel to the herdsmen running to the nearby city to tell them about how Jesus had thrown out the legion of demons, and they entered the herd of pigs and jumped off a cliff. The Samaritans in the city then come all the way out to confront Jesus, and he hasn't moved from the spot from where the woman left him earlier, and that's a parallel to the story from Mark. The townspeople came out to investigate, and Jesus and the disciples had been standing in the exact same place the whole time. John even preserves Mark's continuity error in this scene. In Mark, it never says that the herdsmen came back out with the townspeople, but the herdsmen's presence is revealed through dialogue. In John, it never says that the woman from the well came back out with all the other Samaritans, but it's, again, revealed in offhand dialogue that she did. Another thing, I get why the herdsmen would frantically run off to the nearest town, you know, given that they had just witnessed an astonishing miracle that also permanently destroyed their entire family business in the space of about 30 seconds. But why does the Samaritan woman have to run to the nearest town? In the middle of a conversation at that, like she just runs off right when Jesus is about to say something. 
what is she, like running back there to announce it to the whole nation? Like, I just met a guy who knows all about my five divorces, guys. Remember my five divorces, everyone? In reality, John is borrowing from Mark, and since John has apparently banned any reference to exorcism in this book, it means that he can now treat the exorcism stories from the synoptics like they're his own personal bargain bin that he can ruffle through to find any odds and ends that he wants to plug into his own stories. And lastly, we can note that in keeping with the requirement for Jesus to have only as much activity in Samaria as is strictly necessary, John imposes a two-day limit on his time there, which is the same time limit that the Didache imposed on wandering missionaries. Let them stay with you one day, and maybe two days if there's a need. But when we come back, we'll catch up with Jesus after he's finally returned to Galilee. Back after this. Lessons learned and a life with bridges burned. By blind belief, you live confined. Broken free, it's all behind now. Done away with childish creeds. Choose a love and plant and seeds. reading from the Gospel of John. When the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, It's no longer because of what you said that we believe, but we've heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days, he went out from there into Galilee, because Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his fatherland. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. This is quite possibly the most confusing passage in the Gospel of John, which would place it high in the running for the most confusing passage in all of literature. John tells us about a Jesus quote that does not occur in this book. A prophet has no honor in his fatherland. And we especially recognize that saying from Mark the scene where Jesus goes to his hometown and they're ill at ease with him, and he comments on that by delivering that saying. In episode 8, we talked about how Mark invented that hometown incident to create a plausible setting to house this Jesus quote, and Matthew and Luke mostly follow Mark's lead here. And we talked earlier about the fake ecclesiastical redactor, and it shouldn't surprise you that this is yet another line that the theologians try to pawn off onto this phantom. I've even seen some of them try to blame a later copyist for this line. But here's the deal. Either of those two scenarios assumes that the person who added this line was trying to help the reader connect John with the other Gospels. But the use of this quote in John does not correspond to its use in the other Gospels on any possible reading. What the other Gospels say is that Jesus, in his own hometown, in Galilee, was treated poorly. But John has had Jesus go from Judea to Samaria and now to Galilee, which is where John knows Jesus to be from as well. And yet, in John, Jesus is treated quite decently in both Samaria and Galilee. So if the intent was to use that fatherland quote in the same way that the other Gospels used it to connect them with John, you know, then the passage makes no sense. In fact, some commentators have acknowledged that, and they therefore say that the only scenario that makes sense here is that John must think that Jesus is from Judea, you know, because he received a warm welcome in the two out of three places that weren't Judea, and so by process of elimination, the fatherland quote could be only referring to Judea, and that's the scholarly explanation that we're given for this, and this is what I would say to that. 
For anyone who believes that the Gospel of John depicts Jesus as being from Judea, there's an important book that I recommend that I think that you absolutely have to read on this specific topic. And that book is called The Gospel of John, which you should pick up and read the actual words that are on the page instead of relying on whatever your academic mentor said about it in the 1970s or whatever. Because I don't know how the author could be more clear that Jesus comes from Galilee. But where does that leave us on the matter of this fatherland quote? Well, this is what John is actually doing with that quote. I mean, first of all, the fact that he references it at all and, and the way that he references it is a smoking gun that he knew the other Gospels. I mean, it is possible that he could have received it as a standalone quote, but that's when general framework theory becomes so important because let's say it's the second century and you are the author of John. You know, you're in that library like the robot Wally and you find maybe like a fortune cookie sized paper and this is all it says. On one occasion, Jesus said, a prophet has no honor in his fatherland. If that's all you had, then how would you ever know, as all four gospel authors do, that Jesus spoke those words about himself? Especially when you got other Jesus quotes that are like, you know, you stone the prophets that are sent to you and things like that. When he said a prophet has no honor in his fatherland, I mean, he could have been talking about some other prophet. He could have been talking about Isaiah for all you know. But John somehow knows that he said it in reference to himself. So that's number one. The way he uses the quote proves that he knew the synoptics. The second thing is, you know, to understand why John is deploying this quote, we have to jump ahead to much later on when Jesus' opponents say to him, aren't we correct in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? On that occasion, Jesus only rebuts the demon charge, and he says nothing about the accusation that he's a Samaritan. That's why I say that that scene is like the Empire Strikes Back where Leia called him a scruffy-looking nerf herder and he said, Jesus says to Leia, who's scruffy-looking? Now, we'll talk next time about why John didn't have him deny being a Samaritan at that specific moment, but John in general did not let the accusation just sit. Because at that point, if we have been reading his gospel attentively, we already know that Jesus is not a Samaritan, and not just because John already said like three or four times that Jesus is from Galilee. We also know that Jesus is not a Samaritan because when he visited Samaria, he had an absolute whale of a time, and the people there were excellent hosts who treated him with respect, and as we all know, a prophet is not without honor except in his fatherland, as John reminded us. Ipso facto, kagiko ergo sum, Samaria cannot be Jesus' fatherland. But really, the key takeaway here is that John assumes the reader's knowledge of the other Gospels. In fact, it is so evident to John that the reader knows the other Gospels that John doesn't even feel the need to explain where and when Jesus said this quote. But now that Jesus has made it back to his fatherland of Galilee, he first does the cure for the royal official's son, which we already covered in the opening reading, and so we won't talk about it now. But don't despair, because we are literally about to cover four miracles in a row. And the first is the miracle of the pallet. A man has been unable to walk for 38 years. Jesus encounters him when he's lying on his pallet and heals him. He tells him to pick up his pallet and go home. Before we check in with this man, I should mention that this story takes place at the beginning of what is now John chapter 5, which there are quite a few commentators who believe that this chapter is not currently in its rightful place in John's gospel. And they say that it should be swapped with chapter 6, so depending on your perspective, Jesus just got done either feeding the multitude and walking on water or healing the royal official's son after he got back from Samaria. But in this miniseries, we're treating the order of canonical John as the order. So for our purposes, he just healed the royal official's son, basically. But the pallet miracle has two major sources, literary sources, and they're both stories from the Synoptic Gospels. And John is specifically following Mark's rendition of those stories. And those stories are the healing of the paralytic from Mark chapter 2 and the healing of a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath from Mark chapter 3. In John's tale, Jesus encounters this paralyzed man and he instinctively knows that he's been suffering in that condition for a long time and that's what prompts him to perform the healing. And that's a parallel to the Markin story of the paralytic where Jesus instinctively knew that the Pharisees were doubting him and that's what prompted him to do the healing there. When Jesus heals the man in John, he says, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk, which is 95% similar to what he said to the paralytic in Mark. 
But what's most notable is that he even preserved the same word for the guy's little bed that Mark used. And this was a word that Matthew and Luke both avoided because it was considered a barbarous, vulgar loan word from Latin. And the grammarian Phrynikos had said in his book on style that it should never be used. Uh, Phrynikos, by the way, uh, active in the second century. So if Matthew and Luke avoided that word because of his book, then a lot of people have a lot of explaining to do. But continuing in the story, John tells us that the man was healed immediately, just like Mark's paralytic was. And immediately is, of course, Mark's favorite word. Now, the man walks off, but he's soon confronted by the Jewish authorities. And this is where John starts bringing in elements of the other story from Mark that he consulted here, the healing of the man with the withered hand. Because first, the authorities tell this guy, uh, it isn't lawful for you to carry your pallet on the Sabbath, just as Jesus in the Gospel of Mark had asked whether it was lawful to do good or evil on the Sabbath. The authorities then want to know who healed him, and the man says he doesn't know, so they send him on his way. Then Jesus meets up with him again, and he tells him to sin no more, similar to how he told the paralytic in Mark that his sins were forgiven. At that point, the man goes back and identifies Jesus to the Jewish authorities, and that's followed by a major confrontation, a dialogue between Jesus and his opponents, one of several in this book. Now, why did John put in that weird sequence where first the guy said that he didn't know who healed him, then later he went back and he told him that it was Jesus? It's because even though John is following the story from Mark, where there was a controversy about Jesus healing on the Sabbath, he can't follow that story too closely, and that's for ideological reasons. Now, Mark doesn't care at all that the Pharisees saw Jesus heal the man's withered hand. In fact, it's, it's necessary to Mark that they saw it. But John is limiting the amount of miracles that the Jewish opponents get to see at this time. And he's setting them up for the biggest miracle of all time that we'll cover in the next show. But Jesus defends himself here. And it's notable that the author of John lets us know here that this healing that he did on the Sabbath was the primary reason for which the Jews were persecuting him, just like how in the Gospel of Mark, his healing on the Sabbath was also a turning point. Mark says that after that, his opponents went out and began giving counsel on how to destroy him. The main difference, though, is that John then proceeds to expand upon and perhaps correct Mark's statement. Because when they charge Jesus with unlawfully healing on the Sabbath, he says, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. And then the author breaks in with his director's commentary. That's why the Jews were trying to kill him all the more, folks. He not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he also called God his own father and made himself equal with God. And I joke that this is a director's commentary, but it sometimes seems like it's actually a director's commentary on the Gospel of Mark and not the Gospel of John that the author actually wrote. Because here, it's like he's talking past the reader to an imaginary opponent and clarifying that Jesus wasn't only persecuted because of the reason that Mark said. There was a much deeper and more significant reason. It's the kind of unnecessary aside that would be hard to explain if John was based on independent tradition, but it makes total sense if John is primarily based on the synoptics. But we'll now look at another miracle, the healing of the blind man. And this one and the pallet miracle are a doublet. And this one occurs later in the book. It's in chapter 9. The story appears to take place in Jerusalem, but there isn't a coherent transition from the passages that immediately come before it. And indeed, the story itself, it begins with the words, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. As he passed by what? But we're probably asking the wrong question because as he passed by happened to be the same words that Mark used when he introduced the story of the calling of Levi from the tax booth. Now, my own theory on the healing of the blind man, since this is ultimately just a duplicate of the pallet miracle, my theory is that in writing it, John used a technique that the theologians usually attribute to the author of the secret gospel of Mark that was the subject of the last bonus show. What I mean by that is that he used some characteristic phrases from Mark to help him build up this story so that it sounded like an authentic Jesus tale, you know, like from the Gospels, you know. For one thing, he pulls from a unique section in Mark that neither Matthew nor Luke carried over into their Gospels, where Jesus healed a blind man by spitting in his eyes and laying his hands on him. And just as an aside, Tacitus tells a story about the Emperor Vespasian healing someone by anointing his eyes and cheeks with saliva. And anyone who believes that the gospel miracles are true is also utterly required to believe that that one was true because Tacitus says that eyewitnesses are still talking about it, quote, even now when falsehood brings no reward. So there's no reason to doubt his testimony. 
But with John's use of this spitting story, we have yet another example, of which there are surprisingly many in this book, of John following Mark where Matthew and Luke didn't dare tread. John has Jesus spit on the ground and make clay out of the spit and apply it to the man's eyes, and he sends him to the healing pool. And that's another similarity with Mark, because in Mark, that healing was done in two stages, just as it is here. The initial action by Jesus wasn't enough to fully complete the healing. But I said that this whole thing is a doublet of the pallet miracle, and that's especially clear in the aftermath. First of all, this healing also took place on the Sabbath, and the Jewish authorities, again, fail to actually witness the healing, and they question the guy about it afterwards, and then they go away, and the man has another encounter with Jesus, just like in the last story. And Jesus lets us know that everything that just happened was symbolic, that is fake, when he says, quote, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who don't see can see, and that those who see can become blind. And so this episode in John was really just a setup for the author to launch into a complex discussion of doctrine. And as I said, he strung this story together using plot points and phrases from the Gospel of Mark. And something else that we saw in both of these stories was basically a combination of a healing miracle from the Gospel of Mark with a controversy story about Jesus performing miracles on the Sabbath. And I believe it was Raymond Brown who pointed this out, but in the infancy gospel of Thomas, it says that the five-year-old Jesus was making pigeons out of clay, and it was the Sabbath, and he got yelled at, and he clapped his hands, and the pigeons came to life and flew away. And the point is that the author combined a generic miracle with the theme of Jesus getting in trouble for violating the Sabbath. And so I think that that literary device can be seen as a legendary accretion. It's as if John is telescoping the other Gospels, or he's telescoping the Gospel of Mark, and telling two stories at once in order to better get to the point and streamline the presentation. And I think it's a sure sign that he knew the Synoptic Gospels. And that obviously goes for the author of the Infancy Gospel as well. Because think about this. If you were going to have the baby Jesus getting in trouble for breaking the Sabbath, it isn't necessarily a given that you would have him breaking the Sabbath by performing a miracle. I mean, to me, writing about a five-year-old Jesus who who would barely understand what the Sabbath even is, perhaps you could have had him trying to help his family. Like, he doesn't understand why no one's heating up any food, so he takes it upon himself to try to bake something, and he gets scolded. But no, they combined the Sabbath breaking with a miracle. Because they were so familiar with the Jesus of the synoptics that they were able to freely rearrange and conflate the various circumstances in which that version of the Jesus character found himself. And I think that that applies to these two healing pericopes in John as well. But we now move on to our next miracle, which is actually a series of two. The feeding of the 5,000, which is immediately followed by the walking on water. In the first one, Jesus feeds the entire crowd with five loaves and two fish. In the second, his disciples are crossing the sea in a boat, and he comes to them at night walking on the waves. There are some who believe that the first ever gospel, whatever it was, whether it was Mark, they believe that it was designed to be acted out, like a play. And I've always doubted that, because that would have been ruinously expensive. Because think about it, first you need like a gigantic amount of extras for the feeding scene, and then you'd have to flood the Colosseum to do the water sequence, and then unflood it for the next scene. In fact, now that I think about it, Mark in particular seems to have been trying to prevent this book from being done as a play because he has about four aquatic scenes. So maybe he was trying to make it too expensive for anyone to ever try to reenact. But at any rate, one of the strongest suggestions that John was aware of Mark is that both Gospels have Jesus walking on the water immediately after the feeding of the 5,000. And we'll talk more about that later. But let's start by looking here at John's version. It starts at the beginning of chapter 6, and again, there are many who believe that chapters 5 and 6 have been transposed. So again, depending on your perspective, this scene either takes place right after Jesus healed the royal official's son, or right after he defended himself for healing the man with the pallet. But Jesus comes to the shore of the Sea of Galilee, which John helpfully tells us is also called the Sea of Tiberias, and I thank him for unnecessarily giving us a clue that he wrote this gospel in the second century, since that's when that name began to be commonly used. It then says that a large crowd followed Jesus because they saw the signs that he was performing on the sick. And the fact that Jesus performed signs on the sick, at this point in the Gospel of John, that statement is only accurate in like the most narrow, technical sense possible. It's a very accurate statement if he's referring to the parallel point in the Gospel of Mark, however, 
And so maybe that's what he means. This crowd, they had all read the gospel of Mark, and that's how they knew that they could all congregate in a giant mass wherever Jesus was, and he would cure them. Because there's no precedent for such a thing in John, even though John is now presenting this crowd's behavior as totally normal. Now, Mark took this story, the feeding of the 5,000, from another source. We see the evidence of that from Mark's redactional activity. The story in its original form seems to have begun with the assumption that the crowd was already there. Most likely, it began with a phrase like, one time, Jesus and the disciples were in front of a big crowd. But Mark, for his own literary purposes, begins this sequence with Jesus and the disciples by themselves in a secluded area. And to reconcile this setting with the story of the feeding of the 5,000 that he inherited, Mark therefore has to backtrack and he has to let us know that, you know, even though Jesus and the disciples went to a secluded place, the crowd saw them going there. And that's Mark basically covering his own ass because he knows that he's about to do a story that begins with the line, when Jesus went out, he saw a large crowd. So ultimately what that means is that Mark mentions the arrival of the crowd twice. I mean, that's the result. And it's clear as to why that's the case. But I have to confess that it is not as clear as to why John has to mention the arrival of the crowd twice, especially if John is an independent author who learned about this miracle from oral tradition or even from witnessing it firsthand. Because never forget, the mainstream theologians downplay this, but in their scheme, it is not impossible that the Gospel of John ultimately comes directly from reminiscences of one of the Twelve, or it was even actually written by one of the Twelve, as conservatives believe. But if John was independent and wasn't relying on Mark, he could have begun the story any way he wanted to. He could have had the crowd coming down from the moon and landing on the earth. But what does he do instead? He says that Jesus came to the seashore and a large crowd followed him. Then Jesus went up the mountain and sat down. The Passover was coming up. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes, saw that a large crowd was coming to him. By the way, large crowd. The adjective is another example of something that John shares with Mark, but Matthew and Luke don't share with Mark. And Matthew and Luke unquestionably did not know this tale from any other book than Mark. Also, John says that Jesus went on to the mountain. What mountain? This is the first time he's mentioned that setting, yet he brings it up in such a way as to suggest that we know what he's talking about. In fact, the mountain is one of the generic settings in the Gospel of Mark. It's one of Mark's favorite random spawn points for the Jesus character, another one being the house. And these are like safe spaces for Jesus that Mark can put him in when he isn't sure where a particular scene or exchange of dialogue should take place. And the mountain in Mark is where Jesus summoned the disciples, and he'll return there once he feeds the 5,000. But the mountain has never been mentioned in John, and so John is copying that detail from Mark, but he's actually going even beyond that. He is, in fact, cleaning up Mark's narrative by making sure to establish the mountain at the beginning of the pericope. And we've already seen several examples of John tweaking something from the other Gospels to make it more plausible or more sensible or more supposedly historical. And this is another one. It is a clear sign that John was familiar with Mark. But continuing, when the crowd gets there, John improves Mark's narrative even further. In Mark, the disciples were the ones who cared about how the crowd would get enough food, and the author of John changes that to have Jesus be the one who's concerned. And then we get some legendary accretion in that we hear some dialogue from named characters like Philip and Andrew, whereas in the parallel story in Mark, the disciples participated, but they were nameless and faceless drones. Jesus asks Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these can eat? And then the author immediately hits the pause button and does his commentary. Jesus was saying that just to test him, ladies and gentlemen. And this is one of those instances where the DVD commentary is the result of the author changing something from the synoptics and then belatedly realizing that it put him in a tight spot. I personally find this exchange here to be one of the best pieces of evidence that John was following Mark. Because the only reason that he had to add that line of narration is because he had shifted that concern over the crowd and how they would eat from the disciples to Jesus. But now that he has Jesus being the one to ask, you know, like what restaurants are around so that these people can get some food, like, I don't know, is there, is there a Roy Roger? It creates a major inconsistency in that it makes Jesus look like he didn't know that the crowd had enough food. And remember, this is the gospel where Jesus is supposed to be unambiguously, indisputably the son of God. And the subtext of John's gospel is that anyone who doesn't understand that is like almost beyond saving in more ways than one. 
And it's okay for John to have Jesus run out of breath or cry over his friend passing away. These are things that, like, they are not to uh, reinforce the belief in the reader that Jesus was also a physical man, as is often said. I rather think that those things like Jesus wept and so on, those were put in as proofs of the author's orthodoxy, regardless of whether he believed that, you know, Jesus could get tired or get upset or ask for a drink or not. The author knew that his reputation for orthodoxy wasn't as strong as it could have been, and so he put in these exaggerated details that emphasized Jesus' physicality. And it's kind of like someone who was accused of being a communist in the Red Scare. And so after that, they might write a screenplay that has just over-the-top anti-communist stuff to just try to get them above suspicion. And so John makes those concessions for Jesus at the physical level, but never at the mental level. Jesus knows everything. The doctrinal economy of the Gospel of John cannot function if that is not the case. And yet here, because he couldn't resist making a change to his source, which was Mark, he violated that rule and he made Jesus appear to be out of the loop. And that's why he then had to come right back in as the director and give us the lame explanation that you know, actually Jesus was trying to trick Philip here. But that was the director's commentary that we just talked about. So let's see how Philip responds. Quote, 200 denarii worth of bread isn't sufficient for everyone to receive a little, end quote. If John was independent, or even if he recognized that the miraculous feeding is actually based on something from 2 Kings chapter 4, he would have understood that the specific dollar value of the potential food was superfluous to mention. But we know of one ancient author who would actually have begged to differ, and that was the author of Mark's Gospel, who was very interested in tacking on usually exaggerated valuations or enumerations to his material. He has 2,000 pigs jumping off a cliff into the sea in a completely landlocked place, by the way. The woman dumps 300 denarii of oil onto Jesus' head, and the disciples say that they shouldn't have to go buy 200 denarii worth of food. Matthew and Luke had none of these numbers. John and Mark have two of them in common. Now, I spent probably like half a day trying to figure out how much it would cost to buy bread for 5,000 people in the year 100. And what I can report is that 200 denarii is surprisingly accurate, actually. 300 denarii for a flask of oil or spikenard, though. No. We are under no obligation to accept that. That is silly money for that, which in that context is actually the point. Now, John will provide an exaggerated number of his own later on when he has Nicodemus literally bring 75 pounds of ointment to Jesus' tomb. So John seems to think that ridiculous exaggerations of numbers are appropriate when you're writing a gospel, and that would appear to be a technique that he learned from Mark. And as we said, he borrowed the detail about them having to spend 200 denarii on bread, which I would actually be willing to bet was an artifact of the source, and none of these four authors between them knew whether that number was plausible or not. Matthew and Luke suspected that the number was too high, so they didn't include it. Mark and John figured that the number being too high was kind of the point. Either way, John didn't come up with the number independently. But after Philip mentions the 200 denarii, we then hear from Andrew. Andrew says that someone in the crowd has five loaves and two fish. And those amounts for the loaves and the fish are the same across all four versions and all four Gospels. Jesus has the crowd sit down, and John makes sure to tell us that there was a lot of grass there. He mentioned the grass because Mark had mentioned it. Mark said that they all sat on the green grass, and I think that John went out of his way to bring up the grass because he probably had the same thought that some modern commentators have had which is that specifying that the grass is green, it might provide a hint as to the time of year in which the story is taking place. And John, having completely rewritten the chronology and the itinerary, and you know he's having Jesus go to the temple several times at different times of the year, I think John is much more cautious about time cues than Mark was. And so he kept Mark's extra detail here, but he put his own spin on it. But then Jesus does the miracle, and he feeds the 5,000. And he says, you're all going to eat this. I don't want to hear any of you complaining that you're crowding together so much that you're totally unable to eat bread. Now, during this scene, John borrows another unique phrase from Mark when he says that Jesus gave the loaves to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish. Just as Mark said that the disciples picked up the baskets and the broken pieces of bread and also of the fish. So Mark and John, again, have a connection that isn't shared by Matthew and Luke. 
You know, it's always possible, by the way, that a lot of these details come from a secondary version of Mark. It's something that we can't rule out. And that would explain why Matthew and Luke don't know them, but John usually knows them. In other words, John may have had access to a later version of Mark than Matthew or Luke did. And that would also explain one of the mysteries of the theory of John being derivative, which is the question of why John focused on Mark so much. That is, if he possibly or even probably had access to Luke and Matthew as well. And it could be that a new edition of Mark had just come out, and Mark was therefore relevant again, or experiencing a resurgence. And speaking of Mark, as we transition now to Jesus walking on the water, I remind you that John has preserved Mark's connection of this segment to the one that came before it. And I specifically said that it's Mark's connection, and I'll explain that shortly. But first, going back to the theologian Percival Gardner-Smith, who believed that John was based on independent tradition— Even he admitted that this connection between these two miracles was a stumbling block for him and for his theory. But then he remembered, this is New Testament studies. I don't have to come up with actual proof of anything. It's all fake. And so he explained the circumstance of John and Mark both seemingly independently connecting these two miracles as being natural because these two miracle stories, according to him, quote, go well together. Which, I mean, that's obviously very lame, but it's also something we can actually test. If the miraculous feeding had been connected with the walking on water in the oral tradition before it reached Mark and before it reached John, we would expect to see a relatively smooth transition between those two miracles in both Gospels. That is something we do not find. What we find instead is that Mark's transition between them is awkward and forced, and John's transition is just a slightly cleaned up version of Mark's. Now, as I alluded to, Mark was the one who combined these miracles, and he did it for his own literary purposes. And we can look at the analyses of the literary structure of Mark that have been done by commentators like Werner Kelber, and they've demonstrated that Mark has imbued his miraculous feeding episodes and his episodes in which Jesus and the disciples cross the sea with doctrinal, theological, and religious significance. They're symbolic. And so Mark has forced the walking on water into this section of the gospel for symbolic reasons. And functionally, what happens in Mark is that Jesus feeds the 5,000, he sends the disciples away in a boat, then he sends the crowd away. Then he goes to pray on the famous mountain, and then it's evening, and suddenly he's back on land again. And Mark tells us that the disciples' boat is still only in the middle of the sea, which it's really a lake, first of all, and it's only eight miles wide, at its widest point. And technically, the disciples are only traveling four miles, according to Mark. So by that time, they could have been back and forth like 25 times already. And then it says that Jesus walks on the water to the boat, basically at at four o'clock in the morning. So clearly, Mark had extreme difficulty integrating the walking on water here, because for the walking on water to make sense and to be integrated with the story that came before it, you have to create a scenario where Jesus, you know, it's, like, it's kind of like that thing where the farmer has to take the two animals and the bag of grain across the river. You know, it's a puzzle. Because you have to have Jesus and the disciples together at first, and then Jesus has to separate himself from the disciples, and then the disciples have to get into the boat and travel away enough of a distance to where they don't see Jesus approaching, uh, like, from the shoreline. You know, because their reaction when they do see Jesus is as if he's like an apparition from the depths, almost. So they have to be far enough away from land to where they didn't see him start walking on the water. And if it's dark out, then that works even better. And so that's why Mark has it take place at night. And for everything I just said, there also has to be like a plausible narrative reason for it to happen. There has to be a reason why Jesus sent the disciples off in the boat by themselves. There has to be a reason why he waited so long to catch up with them. And it's not impossible to come up with a scenario that accounts for all those things. But the problem for Mark is that that wasn't what he had to do. What he had to do was force it into the matrix of the pre-existing miraculous feeding story. And I want to emphasize, I'm not trying to be new atheisty here and, and trying to demonstrate that Jesus could never have walked on water. I mean, that's self-evident, I would have thought. These implausibilities that I'm pointing out are, are source critical. I'm trying to show that Mark redacted these two incidents together. But let's turn to John and see how he handles the transition. Well, he has Jesus feed the 5,000. The crowd then declares him to be the eschatological prophet, and they try to seize him and make him king. Then he withdraws to the mountain alone, and then this happens, quote, Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into a boat, they crossed the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus hadn't yet come to them, end quote. Where are you guys going? 
I mean, did Jesus say it was okay for you to just take the boat and just leave him there to get seized by the crowd? I mean, he never gives them permission to leave in the Gospel of John. Now, he did that in the Gospel of Mark. So, I mean, I don't know. I guess the author of John is assuming that the disciples have read Mark, and, and that's how they knew they could take the boat. Or at least that we, his audience, have read the Gospel of Mark and can fill in that detail from our memory. But what John is doing here is streamlining Mark's transition and cleaning it up. He's trying to make the story plausible and fulfill all those requirements of the things that have to happen that we talked about. And so he uses Mark as a starting point. But instead of having Jesus dismiss the disciples, he has Jesus get run off, essentially. And the disciples eventually figure out that he must not be coming back. And so they wait until nighttime, and then they get in the boat and leave. But these problems with just the intro to the walking on water could potentially fill an entire episode. So let's just get to the miracle itself. In Mark's version, Jesus walks on the water and the disciples are afraid. We are told why they were afraid. They thought it was a ghost. Jesus tells them to take courage. He says the words, I am. He gets in the boat and the wind stops. John's version is similar, including the I am that he ends up adopting as Jesus' catchphrase, except one major difference is that John forgets to explain why the disciples were afraid. So he adopted the disciples being afraid from Mark, but he didn't like the reason that Mark gave for them being afraid, which was that they thought Jesus was a ghost, but he didn't come up with his own reason. I mean, maybe they're afraid because Jesus caught them stealing his boat. You know, now he's emerging from the waves like Principal Skinner when he was tracking down Bart when he cut school. Or because John is supposedly independent, and so he's not beholden to any of Mark's plot line. Maybe John is about to take this story in a totally different direction. I mean, maybe Jesus isn't even the main character in this book. Maybe the disciples are the main characters, and we're going to continue now to follow them as they've now escaped this colorful, larger-than-life character that they've been with for like the past 20 minutes of the movie, and now they're free to continue their mission. They've got their boat back, and they're going to now continue to make their way up the Nung River. And the only time that Jesus will ever appear again in this book is in the next scene when the disciples have pulled the boat under some reeds and are hiding from him as he flies around looking for them. And the last we ever hear of him is a repeated line of dialogue that ultimately fades away. I will not hurt or harm you. Just give me back the boat, Peter. It was a good boat. As a fisherman, you know how hard it is to find a boat you like. But today we've continued our progress through the Gospel of John and continue to present the evidence for John being a derivative work. And given the evidence we've looked at today and the evidence we'll continue to see, we'll soon find it very easy to see the attempt to preserve John's independence as a case of special pleading meant to shore up the minimum historical Jesus. And in the name of Saint Candida, thank you for listening. Go in peace. What other stories of mythology do you think of as historical reality? 